Welcome to My Hometown, the program that explores clubs, organizations, businesses, and issues across Nassau and Suffolk counties and sheds light on the different towns that are making a difference. Hello and welcome to My Hometown. I'm Bill Horan. Our guest today is from an organization called Humane Long Island. His name is John D. Leonardo, and he is the president and executive director of Humane Long Island. John, welcome to my hometown on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHBC. Thanks very much for having me on. John, tell us a little bit about yourself and what made you an advocate for animals. Absolutely. Well, I actually uh, studied uh, psychology and um, and religion while I was in college. And oh, took, a perfect background, of course. Yeah, we'd, we'd expect that. <laughs> so yeah, as I took a, a world a world religions course, and I I learned about um, a little known religion called Jainism, where uh, the practitioners have historically been vegetarian for thousands of years, and the monks, um, you know, some of the, some of the monks literally wait for nuts and berries to fall off trees because they don't want to molest the plant. So around that same time, I was learning about how uh, animals are, are confined in CAFOs or factory farms in horrific conditions. They have their ends of their, their beaks cut off and their toes cut off. Um, so I, and, and meanwhile, I was eating these animals. So I learned about this, this culture that, you know, was eschewing all meat. And even these monks were just literally waiting for the berries and nuts to fall off the trees. And I said, what's wrong with me? I, I got to stop eating animals. I got to live by my ethics. So after that class, I went, I went to lunch. I, I loaded up a, a plate full of chicken in the cafeteria. Couldn't eat it, shoved it away. And then I started looking more into these issues. And a year later, I learned about in the dairy industry how, how mo- mother cows and their babies are torn from each other and how baby roosters in the egg industry are ground up alive because they can't lay eggs. So I decided to put my money where my mouth was and, and stopped eating dairy and eggs as well um, and decided I really wanted to make animal advocacy a career. And obviously that was an impressive class you went to because it it certainly converted you in this direction. So now you personally believe in it, but how did Humane Long Island come about? So we were actually founded as um, an animal circus protesting organization. Um, Shortly after I, uh, you know, I I stopped eating meat, I somehow got on um, PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, mailing list. And they told me uh, that for our audience, PETA is the organization. PETA is the largest animal rights organization in the world. And they protect animals. And, and when we see people wearing fur coats, they're the ones who are usually in the background uh, campaigning against. Yep. Them. Okay. Yep. They, yeah. They, they're, they're the leading animal rights organization in the world. So they they protest against the use of animals for food, the use of animals for, for clothing um, and exploitation of animals just just in general. So. Um, uh, so I got an email from them um, with some pictures of baby elephants that were in Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus um, that were being hit with stun guns and um, weapons called bull hooks, which are basically large, heavy metal batons with hooks and spikes on one end. Um, and I had no idea that this is how they, they treated animals in the circus. So I said, of course, I'm going to go join these protests. Um, and the people that were running the protests were, were elderly, and they had been doing it a long time. And they said, next year, young blood, you're in charge. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good way to get there. If you're yep. the youngest guy in the group, yep. everybody yep. says step forward, and they just step back, and you're ahead of it. Sure. So I was like, yeah, well, this is my first demo, but I guess this is what's going on. So um, so sure enough, last the, the following year, we, we led the demonstrations. And then there was another circus called um, Cold Brother Circus that was coming to town. I remember that, yeah. Yeah. So uh, no one had protested Cold Brothers for years. So I said, oh, if we're protesting Ringling, why don't we protest Cold Brothers as well? So we went out and, and we actually, I looked into Cold Brothers and I found that they actually had were in criminal um, probation for violations of the Endangered Species Act for illegally selling Asian elephants. Um, they had also gotten a whole a whole number of um and Welfare Act violations for beating elephants with bull hooks. And their their head of animal care was actually um, on video beating an electroshocking elephants. So we, we went out, and um, we, when it comes to Ringling Brothers Circus, most people already bought their tickets online. Um, so we, we were just urging people not to come back. With Cold Brothers Circus, people buy their tickets right at the gate. So we actually had the opportunity to reach people before they put their money down. 
and we turned away thousands of dollars in ticket sales. And it was so empowering that um, that not even me, everyone else, my friends who I dragged along to join the, the circus, actually a hunter who I dragged <laughs> to join the circus too, they said, hey, we need to do we need to do more of these protests. We need to tackle other issues. This is empowering. This is powerful. We're helping animals. So when I said, okay, well, who's in charge? And they said, well, you. <laughs> So this is a like, fast track to the top. We really should have you on some of the business shows. Yeah, right. How to get to the top of, <laughs> of the line. Now, what would you describe if you're sitting next to me in the airport? I say, what do you do, John? And what would you, what in effect does um, your position as head of Humane Long Island? What does what do you do on a daily basis? Yeah, so um, I would tell people that I'm an anthrozoologist, um, and what that means. Oh, that's clear. Is, that's the end of it. Yeah, okay, we'll see you next week. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, so what that means is um, it's a mixture of anthropology, which is the study of human culture, and zoology, which is the study of of animals. So, um, so I study the interconnections between humans and other animals, and I have my master's in that that field from Canisius College. So, while some people decide to go into research, I decided to, you know, uh, apply it to practice. So we founded Humane Long Island. I worked for seven years, actually, um, for PETA. And uh, it was great because starting, I st- uh, my first ever protest for animals was at Nassau Coliseum of Ringling Brothers Circus. And by the time we shut down Ringling Brothers Circus, I was leading the Ringling Brothers campaign for PETA and all their animals entertainment campaigns. I was their senior manager. And their last ever show was right here at Nassau Coliseum. So it really came full circle. So, I mean, when when people ask me, what do I do on a daily basis? It really varies a lot. I could be out protesting the circus. I could be in here talking about animals with you. Um, or I could be uh, taking a duckling to the vet or or you know, out in uh, in the wilderness rescuing uh, abandoned ducks or abandoned domestic animals uh, who won't be able to survive. Uh, I, I did all these things in the past three days. <laughs> no, I mean, that's certainly a lot of variety, certainly interesting. Um, but I'm, I'm going to ask the question that I think our audience is wondering, how do you get paid? Because the ducks aren't going to say, here's a few bucks for you or thank you or, you know, I'll ask my mother to send you a check. So how do you get paid for that? So we're a nonprofit. We're, we're completely funded by, um, by member donations. So if you would like to support us, please go to humanelongisland.org or you could donate um, to us via our, our Facebook or Instagram at humaneli. And we'll ask you that information again before the end of the show. So if someone's listening and you're saying to yourself, gee, I I can't get that down that quickly or whatever, John will give us that information once again because you see the work he's doing. It's obviously terrific. Um, How about other positions for people? Like if someone wants to get involved and they say, this guy is really on the ball. He knows what he's doing. I want to help like this. Um, How, you know, are are you limited to uh, students who are studying? animal studies or uh, like yourself, you seem to have a totally different background. How do people get involved with your organization? I tell people if they want to help animals, they can do it with any background or any field. Um, So if people want to get involved, contact me. Tell me what your skill set is. Tell me how you think that that you can benefit our organization, and we'd love to have more volunteers. So we so we we need volunteers from everything for basic animal care, which we can train, to um, uh, to tabling at events, to doing PR. I mean, we, we we do a lot of interviews like this because I think it's important to get the animals for the animals' messages out to the masses. So I'm very grateful to be on this show and speaking to all your listeners today. So what I'm hearing is if someone is out there and wants to help, you'll find a way to use their skill or their talents to the best, best match both for them and for you, and it'll be a win-win. Absolutely, and win for the animals as well. How about, uh, you mentioned the other organization, uh, basically they got older, they aged out, I guess. But how about, uh, are a lot of your volunteers students, either high school, college, who kind of see the world the way you do and really want to help and get involved? Because this seems like a wonderful uh, learning experience. Yeah, we, we take we take interns both in, um, in college and in uh, graduate programs. So, and a lot of them have moved on to, um, you know, other organizations where they are actually getting paid for this work with uh, Mercy for Animals, with People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, In Defense of Animals. So, if you think animal rights is a career path that you might want to take, I mean, I think the best thing to do is to volunteer with an organization like ours. But the background people must get, again, they probably get to do a lot of things they wouldn't get in another organization. They're doing something good for society. They're meeting other very caring people who are 
trying to make the earth a little better. So uh, it's kind of a win-win-win on many fronts. Absolutely. Uh, John, before we go further, I'd like to let our audience know that you're listening to My Hometown on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I'm Bill Horan. Our guest today is John D. Leonardo. He's the president and executive director of Humane Long Island. Um, John, I guess what brings in people most, there's probably some really amazing stories you have. And could you give us maybe an anecdote or two of the work you're doing and the people in your organization are doing? Yeah, absolutely. Well, just last week, we actually um, met with uh, representatives of uh, St. John the Baptist High School about hatching projects. Uh, They were hatching um, little baby ducklings in their classrooms. Apparently, they had been doing this for more than 40 years. Um, So we spoke to them about how baby ducks are not school science experiments and they're not props, you know, to, to be used in this manner. Um, and they agreed to actually give us the ducklings, and uh, we just sent five of them up to uh, up to Woodstock Farm Sanctuary yesterday. We have five more that are going to go to Merrimack Farm Sanctuary in Vermont, where they're going to be loved and never eaten. So uh, it's oh, no, that's yeah. a, that is a good happy ending, and I'm sure the students didn't realize, or even, maybe even the teachers, it's a learning experience, and in some way. You know, something has to bend a little bit, no matter what we're learning, whether it's our time or money or cost of things. But that's great that everybody wins. And again, for the students. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's a very humane lesson for the students to teach them reverence for these animals, to teach them that they're not props. They're thinking, feeling persons just like you or I. When I hear the word humane, I think of dogs and cats. Mm-hmm. But it, sounding, it sounds like to me your organization is more either more focused or maybe just the stories on other animals that are around us in nature. Is that the case? Yeah, we, we do advocate for dogs and cats, but we advocate much more for the non-traditional animals um, because there's lots of dogs and cat rescues out there. There's not too many duck rescues. There's not too many sloth rescues. Um, wait, 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 wait. Say that again? So, Slots. That's, oh, yeah. They were all over my neighborhood. They, <laughs> I mean, I know the word, uh-huh. but somehow we don't think of those on Long Island. I'm thinking either jungle or farm or something. So can you tell us about the sloths? Yeah, jungles are, are where they should be. Um, sloths are, um, are tree-dwelling, solitary animals um, that are mostly deaf and blind in daylight. Um, they live out in, in places like Costa Rica and Argentina. But more recently, there's a, a guy named Larry Wallach. He blacked out the windows of an old pool supply store in Hopog, stuck nine slots inside, and was charging people admission to go in. This was obviously very illegal, didn't file for any of the appropriate permits. Slots, again, these are tropical tree-dwelling animals. They're wild animals. They don't belong in on Long Island. They belong in the tropics of Costa Rica. And they also don't want to be handled by humans. So we've gotten reports of many bites at this establishment. He actually has many charges pending against him. He has three court dates just this month. I'm guessing when you're saying bites, too, it's the people who are paying money to see them who are yep. getting bitten. Yep. Because um, if, from the scenario I'm getting, uh, this is illegal, if, if I'm hearing this correctly. Yeah, well, the laws need to be tightened up. In Islip, it's absolutely illegal. It's very clear that it can't be going on there. So there's a temporary restraining order that the Supreme Court put down in September that said sloth encounters needed to close. And even the owner has admitted this. But they refused to close and kept acting anyway. So more recently, they got rung up on contempt charges as well as illegal animal possession charges. The legal animal possession charges were related to Nile monitors, which are, I mean, they were three babies. They look real nice and cute. You know, people see them, they say, hey, I, I'd look really cute in my terrarium. But what they didn't realize is these animals grow to be over six feet long and they're venomous. Uh, there was a guy in Maryland who got eaten by his five Nile monitors. So these are animals that were being sold right here illegally on Long Island. I don't mean this as a joke, but this almost sounds like a, a basis for a type of reality show. The, the, uh, obviously, they would take out your day-to-day things that are like most jobs. It's a bit boring answering the phone, mm-hmm. seeing someone at the door. But when you go out and see these creatures and what's going on, I mean, I certainly wouldn't expect that kind of an animal. That's why I was joking with you. Mm-hmm. I didn't think of it as being Long Island. I thought either a jungle would come to mind or maybe farms. I, I really didn't know. So uh, 
Well, you're you're right when you thought jungle. That's okay, where they what should I to be. do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, they, they I have definitely. a future. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they they certainly don't belong in a pool supply store. I'll tell you that. So, I mean, Long Island, they're they're not they're not equipped to live here, and they're not equipped to interact with people in this manner. They're solitary animals, and again, they are mostly blind in daylight, and they're mostly deaf. So, these are animals that you know you can easily startle. They won't know you're there, and then all of a sudden you're there, and they lash out. And like, yeah, I mean, we would too. If someone surprised us at night, we're going to be, go into protective or aggressive mode. And of course, that makes sense. Um, how does someone learn to save an animal? Like right now, what would be the most, uh, I would say on Long Island, we'll use our area here, uh, that we might be likely to see and have no idea. And I'm just going to pick a turtle uh, or a cat. I mean, using two totally different ones. What's the most common call you get, and what should we know about that? The most common we call we actually get is ducks, uh, domestic ducks on Long Island. So, see, um, you know, usually around Easter or with these these hatching projects, people will hatch these little babies. They'll stuff them in Easter baskets, um, and they're cute when they're tiny. I mean, I think they're cute when they grow up, but they're also poop machines when they get older. And the suburbs are not equipped for duck keeping or, in many cases, chicken keeping because most municipalities don't allow roosters. And half of those little chicks that hatch, half of them are going to be boys. So, unfortunately, a lot of people will, will dump these animals, you know, to the public parks or the roadways. Um, in the case of ducks and domestic geese, they'll dump them in, into ponds. But domestic ducks and domestic geese, they have tiny wings. They have large bodies. They were farmed for the farming industry. So they've been selectively bred over thousands of years to the point they don't even have camouflage. They don't have natural instincts. So when you dump them on a pond, not only is it illegal, but they're literally sitting ducks for predators and cruel people. I mean, you asked about what what some of our more interesting rescues are. Um, There was one uh, a few years ago where we actually rescued a Canada goose that had fireworks duct taped to his chest. So thankfully, we were able to save him and release him unharmed, um, but it was a very precarious situation, both for us and the goose. I'm going to tell you, while you were saying that to me, an idea just came to mind, so I'm going to expose it to the world right here now. Um, I don't know, I, I do know, obviously, every organization would like to get more income coming in, but if you made T-shirts up that said duck control and for a donation gave them away, I would be one of the first donors. That just sounds like such a cool shirt and, and saving a little duck. And, and or an animal in the sense of a cool shirt, something to have a conversation. And you might call it a chick magnet or a conversation <laughs> like star- starter. Mm-hmm. No, I think that would be. Mm-hmm. We had a um, uh, a dog trainer on. He had some very his um, branding was mm-hmm. very cute. It was him walking like three different sized dogs, and it was memorable. I remember it now five six years after he was on. So uh, well, well, it's funny you mentioned that because we, we since we found that uh, th- this domestic duck dumping issue was not just an issue local to Long Island, but something happening all over the country with not a lot of people working on it. Um, about two years ago, we launched a Duck Defenders Project where we are this is a program where we work with rescues all over the country and municipalities and even in some cases right now, the, the USDA in Pennsylvania. Um, to amicably resolve conflicts with waterfowl, whether that's Canada geese that a township wants to round up. I mean, a few years ago, we saved, um, we we stopped an eight-year tradition of hundreds of geese being slaughtered in Islip uh, at Islip High School every single year. Most people don't even know this is going on. So we so we took our experience here on Long Island, and we were, were taking that all throughout North America. Um, and recently we rescued, um, w- along with other rescues, 110 uh, ducks in, in one location in Ohio. So our work has gotten quite vast when it comes to waterfowl. And I've been talking about getting shirts that say duck defenders. I, I was going to say that's the other way. Now, I have to, get, again, you're saying some things that are leading me in a totally different direction with a little humor. But when you say amicably resolve issues with ducks, I mean, the first thing that came to mind, here's a room. On one side is, are the ducks. Dr. Phil is in the middle. <laughs> and on the other side are, we're going to call them the bad guys, but maybe people who aren't enlightened about this, like me, till I, we just talked to you. And we might be doing something that could hurt them or harm them in the future. And probably most of us really don't want to. We just don't know any better. Um, how do you educate people about this? Absolutely. So we actually just met with a preserve out in Pennsylvania who um, who had in the past killed Canada geese and um, and they were considering doing it again. And the public was 
outraged about it. I mean, people people love these animals. They go to the parks just to see them in many cases. Um, so we reached out and we, we talked to them about planting a riparian buffer, which is basically um, tall grasses or, or bushes buffering the waterways so that um, that the waterfowl will be less likely to come up and spend large portions of time on that grassy area because they can't see beyond the bushes. So they don't know if there's a predator or, or a person lurking behind. So if you kind of just do habitat modification, um, to if you, if you get yourself in the mind of the goose and say, what, what if, if I don't want the goose here, what, what would I not like if I was a goose? And, oh, some bushes, some big tall grasses. You plant those there, the geese are going to go elsewhere. So we, that, that's little tips and tricks that we try to tell people. I mean, even if you spray grapeseed oil on the grass, it tastes very bitter. When it dries, it, 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 we, we can't see the, the purple U on it, but the, the geese can. So they're not even going to try to eat it and they'll move on. This has been truly educational and a lot of fun. But before we go further again, John, I want our audience to know that you're listening to My Hometown on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I'm Bill Horan. Our guest today is John D. Leonardo. He's the president and executive director of Humane Long Island. And John, before we go further, physically, where are you located? And give us the website where people can learn more. Yeah, we're, we're located in Riverhead, but we operate from Manhattan to Montauk, and our website is org. Now, you say you operate from Manhattan to Montauk, but you were just telling me about an Ohio case you were involved in. Yeah. So it kind of seems like you slip through the fences a little bit and get out to other places. Well, when it comes to waterfowl, we bill ourselves throughout North America. So yeah, really? we, we, do, we do the sloths, and we do the chickens, and we do lots of well, the, the general animal, animal rights and animal protection organization from Manhattan to Montauk. But yeah, when it comes to waterfowl, you know, there, there's not many resources. So we've decided to make ourselves available to people even in Canada. What is your day like? I mean, seriously, are you a, a structured day or do you go in like a doctor and it might be a goose with a broken beak or an elephant or a turtle or, you know, you're laughing, but I really have no idea. It sounds like it must be totally different. And then you're running a campaign probably to raise some funds and giving an educational class. So it sounds like you have to be really wear like five different hats. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I this morning I was helping um, a, a rescue in Utah um, prepare a press release to, to save wildlife out there. My wife is bringing a duck to the vet today, you know, and then now I'm here interviewing with you. After this, I'm going to have to go do some more animal care back at our, our, at our shelter. So, I mean, the day varies quite a bit. I mean, even, even tomorrow, we were supposed to have um, court for, for sloth encounters. That's being delayed. So I have to contact some other press and let them know, you know, the new date. So it really varies every single day. And it can be stressful, but it's exciting. It keeps us uh, on our toes. And it's really a passion project. I mean, I, I can't imagine myself doing anything different. Did you convert your wife to petology or whatever religion we'll call this? Uh, <laughs> because, I mean, it's really nice yeah. of her to do that. She was supposed to be here today to our audience and to give this up. But the duck needed care. And she did the right thing. Took if it was a child, we would take him to the mm -hmm. doctor or the dentist or whatever. And she did the right thing by the animals. So, I mean, that's really caring people that... We have to take our hats off to you. There aren't too many in the world. We usually just run over people. If they're in the road, you know, drive over them. They're an impediment to us. Um, John, how about campaigns? What type of fundraising campaigns, if any, does the Humane Society run? So we, we were just uh, tabling at the Long Island Beltane Festival this past weekend. Um, and then I was also speaking at um, I Love My Park Day in Babylon. So at both these these uh, events, you know, we we are soliciting donations and also educating the public about the humane treatment of animals. So uh, we actually just broke out um, a, a new a new um, fundraising tactic, I guess, um, at uh, at the Beltane Festival, um, where we actually had a little uh, tub of uh, of ducklings or not real ducklings, but plastic ducklings um, that that floated, and we we told we. Um, we asked people if they wanted to buy tickets to uh, to try to win a prize, and they would rescue one of the ducklings with a little net, 
And then if if um, if they could rescue a second duckling that had the same number on the bottom, they win a prize, a little stuffed sloth, a little stuffed dog, or a little stuffed duckling. And people loved it. And I think it was the best fundraising we've, we've had at a tabling event in a long time. So we're always trying to, to think of new, new little ways. We don't have um, a big fundraiser planned yet this year, but we've been talking about maybe starting a vegan festival for uh, you know, either this year or next. And that way, again, we can help the public um, try some nice plant-based food, keep animals off their plate. I mean, we rescue hundreds of animals every single year, but what people don't realize is you can save 200 animals annually simply by not eating them and their products. I, I think that's a great idea. One, it brings out the chefs on Long Island, the fine foods that we could make. And I bet if I tasted some of the things that are vegan foods, I'd say this is better than a cheeseburger, and I don't say that lightly. Mm -hmm. Our audience knows I like my cheeseburgers. But no, I think that's wonderful that uh, you you could be doing that there and and working with them. I read something about Bed Bath & Beyond, and you were protesting against them. How does that come in? Yeah. So so I used to work for PETA for for seven years, and... um, and people for the ethical treatment of animals had contacted Bed Bath and Beyond. I think it was in 2017, urging them to stop selling down products because they the undercover investigations saw that ducks and geese are are regularly stabbed in their necks. They 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 have, um, you know, they're put into these defeatherers where a lot of times they're they're cooked alive. Um, there, there's just horrific treatment of animals in both the meat in- industry but also the, the feathering industry and the skins industry. So they, they urged Bed Bath & Beyond to stop selling down products. Bed Bath & Beyond, you know, refused. So PETA's had a campaign. As many people probably have heard, Bed Bath & Beyond is, is now going down. Um, you know, they just filed for bankruptcy, but they've been a morally bankrupt company for a long time. So we were there um, celebrating their bankruptcy and and reminding the public that when you sell down, you go down. Ooh, <laughs> you've got some good <laughs> sayings. We have to talk after the show. John, this has really been enlightening. I hope our audience is enjoying it as much as I am. Uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. Give us that website real quick where people can get in touch. And if they want to do something for you, what's the best way? Contribute by money? Is, is it product or uh, some ability that they could give you. We, we love whatever way people can support. Money is always appreciated. We are a nonprofit. You know, it, it costs a lot of money to, uh, to feed so many little animals and to rehab them, bring them to the vet all the time. So you can donate at humanelongisland.org. Um, but if your your pockets are a little light and you want to help out, contact us anyway, and we'll put you to work. It'll be a win-win. Uh, we want to thank our guest, John D. Leonardo. He is the president and executive director of Humane Long Island. John, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you very much for having me. And for enlightening us, and especially me, about what's going on. I'd like our audience to know that I'm Bill Horan. I'm here at Nassau Community College. We thank you for listening to this week's edition of My Hometown. We'd like to get your feedback on My Hometown. Send your comments to whpc at ncc.edu. Nassau Community College, where success starts and continues. Till next time, this is Bill St. James. And remember, there's no town like your hometown.